today, uh, indeed, so we have uh, Bob Cousins as our speaker uh, for this month's webinar. Uh, so Bob is a distinguished uh, professor emeritus at the Department of Physics and Astronomy at UCLA. Um, and uh, so he's a particle physicist with, with a lot of you know, interest and expertise in uh, statistical data analysis. And that expertise and interest stems from his kind of career long uh, uh, experience analyzing particle physics data. So has been involved in various kinds of experiments, including experiments uh, you know, looking at kaons at the Brookhaven National Lab, neutrinos at CERN, and most recently since year 2000, he's been at the CMS experiment at the Large Hadron Collider at, at CERN. Um, he's one of the leading experts of, of statistics in Heinz physics. And he's, for example, a long-term uh, member of the CMS uh, statistics committee. And, and by that, he kind of you know, contributes to making sure that the statistical data analysis is done as well as possible uh, in CMS. Uh, many in the community know him uh, as the uh, co-author of the Feldman Cousins uh, method, which is a popular way of constructing confidence intervals in high physics and also in astrophysics. And uh, uh, so, yeah, so today he's going to talk to us about um, uh, some deep issues in uh, hypothesis testing in high physics. So uh, with that, Bob, uh, please go ahead. Okay, thanks uh, everybody. I assume you've read the title. Uh, so let's go on the next slide. Who am I? Well, he actually just said that too. I just uh, emphasize, underline, I don't have any formal training in statistics, but going back to 1983, when I read the first statistics paper in the dusty old um, biomed lab stacks, I've had a hobby reading statistics papers. And uh, why am I here? Well, because Mikkel uh, and Larry and Ann invited me, so thank you. The talk, though, in fact, draws mainly on a paper that I wrote uh, six years ago, uh, wound up getting published in a special issue of Synthes, and I've been intending to uh, take it on the road and talk about it, but as, uh, as, as it happened, I had to wait till I retired and my day job wasn't as heavy. So I'm gonna talk about uh, things you know, I think initially confidence intervals and the duality of the neyman pearson test of the talk title. Uh, the likelihood ratio ordering, as mentioned, this paper by Gary Fellman and myself, then the Bayesian test for the of the talk title, Eli Jeffries, which leads us to the Jeffries Lindley paradox. And most of the talk is about that. And comments on it in the statistics literature, then in uh, my hobby of poking around, I, I found and, and what my responses would would be to those. I'll, I'll get to those comments later. So let's move on. Now, uh, you being statisticians, I assume that most or all the people in the audience will know essentially everything I say about statistics, uh, but I'll say it anyway, just to make sure that there are not subtle or large differences between the way I understand it and the way you do. I also suspect that everyone has read or even written about the Jeffries Lindley paradox at some point, but most or all of you have uh, moved on to other issues relevant to your daily work. So my goal today really is to emphasize that uh, we cannot move on from these issues. Well, uh, that uh, people who care about the foundations uh, that are because they're at the heart of what we do in high energy physics in the hope of inspiring some to re-examine them with these examples from high energy physics that I'll give you in mind. I think I figured out your notation, which is different from ours. The, the capital X is, is the uh, general name for the test statistic. Lowercase is the observed value. They are the parameters. And the model is the probability uh, given or semicolon theta, which contains everything from uh, the parameters to the detector response laws of physics protocol. Okay, so confidence intervals, this may not be the way you're in the habit of explaining them. This is the way I think it's convenient to think about for this talk. It's equivalent, of course. So, so given this model, uh, the important thing is you have to choose an ordering in the sample space. Bayesians already don't like that. Um, which for each theta, you have a different ordering, typically the sample space, which we'll say higher rank is less extreme. And then you specify the fraction of values of the sample space that you consider are not extreme. That's the confidence level. And alpha is one minus the confidence level. And then having observed your value little x, the confidence interval contains all those values of theta for which x is not extreme at the chosen confidence level, given the ordering. And why is this uh, was nice? People think it's because of coverage, which uh, of course you know, but let's let theta sub t be the true fixed unknown value of the parameter. Then on repeated application of the method in an ensemble, ideally we'd have that the probability 
that the true value is in the interval is the confidence level, um, where of course the random variables are the endpoints of the intervals, not theta true, which is fixed and unknown. I say ideally because nuisance parameters in discrete X are a nuisance and make it less than ideal. Um, another point that's often missed by, let's say Bayesians is that the, uh, the experiments in fact, don't have to be the same. That was in Neyman's original paper and in Larry Wasserman's book, in fact. Uh, so for ordering the uh, sample space, there are three common orderings in one dimension where, uh, so you can order X from largest to smallest, that leads to upper limits, smallest to largest leads to lower limits, order from the middle out in quantiles, and that will give you central intervals. But since these require ordering real numbers, they only apply in one dimension. Then in uh, the late 90s, Gary and I doing uh, neutrinos, uh, Gary hit on this, this fourth ordering, which was to order uh, the sample space by a likelihood ratio. It's particularly important when you're near a boundary uh, of uh, which is to take the likelihood of your uh, X given the, the theta for which you're, you're ordering the X divided by the likelihood ratio uh, for the best fit, the maximum likelihood estimate. And uh, so we wrote this paper called a unified approach because it, it gave you one side or two sided intervals kind of automatically and it applies in arbitrary dimensions. So we were pretty happy with this and being a literature hobbyist, we, we looked everywhere in the literature on confidence intervals, uh, didn't, uh, of course, uh, didn't find it anywhere and uh, decided it was new, but just as our paper was in proof, Gary realized it wasn't new at all. And uh, to explain that, we have to turn to hypothesis testing. Uh, which has many cases, but let's focus on the one at the bottom, which is uh, within the same functional form, we want to test a single value theta naught versus all other theta. So that's the nested situation, of course. And this nested hypothesis testing is in fact very common in energy physics. It's pretty much what we do for a living. Uh, so we have our two hypotheses you see written there, the point null, it's sometimes called a sharp uh, hypothesis. So just, uh, Typical, very common example, number one, we have some new physics, which we want to end as a standard model. The signal strength is theta. The null hypothesis is there is no new physics. Uh, so this is zero. The alternative is anything greater than zero, sometimes less than zero if it's quantum mechanical interference. Uh, so for example, in the Higgs search for the Higgs boson going to two photons, before we observed it, we had a somewhat artificial null hypothesis of no Higgs boson because we actually did believe there was a Higgs boson, but that, that the, uh, the null hypothesis was, was no Higgs boson. The alternative was any strength, any strength greater than zero because we wanted to be open to non-standard Higgs bosons. Then after we found it, we, we changed actually. Uh, once we'd ruled out zero for the signal strength, from then on, we've been testing uh, for nine years. Uh, the null hypothesis, which is the standard model prediction uh, against an alternative that's any other, anything other than the standard model. Now, then in, uh, very quickly, you know, frequentist hypothesis testing, Alan Neyman Pearson, for the null hypothesis, you order the sample space X from least extreme to most, most extreme, choose an ordering principle, can depend on the alternative as in likelihood ratio, choose your cutoff alpha, then reject the null if your observed act is in, is in the most extreme uh, uh, under the PDF of the H naught, then by construction alpha is your, your type one error. I won't need type two error in this talk, so I'll skip over that. Then post data, uh, there's an issue because alpha is a pre-data assessment of risk, risk. And once you get your data, you accept or reject, but there's a lot more you can say because after the data are obtained, the p-value is the smallest value of alpha for which H naught would be rejected had it been specified in advance. This is really the definition of p-value I like because it makes the connection to Neyman Pearson theory. Of course, the rub is that uh, typically that p-value was not specified in advance and, and that's why you'll hear people say p-values are not frequentist, but there is this direct connection to Neyman Pearson uh, theory by this definition. Now this is numerically, if not philosophically, the same as used by Fisher and, and I probably more often taught that the p-value is probably under the null of obtaining uh, X as extreme or more extreme. Now in high energy physics, 
Uh, and of course, the rub there is or more extreme is the big thing that Bayesians harp on. Now, in, in higher energy physics, we take that p-value, which I have to emphasize is not based on assumptions or normality in the model. There's a lot of non-normal stuff and Poisson stuff and whatnot in our models. But once we have the p-value, simply for communication, we convert it to a one-tailed z-value, the equivalent number of what we call Gaussian sigma, you call normal sigma. So for the one-tailed test, 1 1.35 times 10 to the minus 3 is 3 sigma, and the famous 5 sigma is, is 2 times 10 to the minus uh, 7. Um, now, uh, what we had missed until our paper was in proof was that in this uh, two things I've described, the intervals and the tests, the theory of these hypotests maps to that of confidence intervals. Uh, you, reje you simply reject H naught at size alpha if and only if theta naught is not in the confidence interval theta one, theta two with confidence level one minus alpha. Of course, they both have to use the same ordering for this map to work. So this is called inverting the test to obtain confidence intervals and vice versa. And well known to statisticians, although maybe not as many as one might think because you'll hear people who don't like name, they don't like uh, p-values, but they like confidence intervals, but their they're, they're, uh, testing is, uh, dual to confidence intervals. Um, so while our paper was in proof, Gary realized uh, after talking to the chair of the Harvard Physics Department that our intervals were simply those obtained by inverting the classic likelihood ratio test, which was in the dusty old books like Kendall and Stewart and, 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 uh, and one since. Uh, in fact, here you see a scan of one and a quarter pages, uh, uh, which is all of our paper plus profiling the nuisance parameters. We hadn't treated nuisance parameters in our paper. So uh, Gary has a funny talk about this you can look at. But in, uh, so this was a shock, but in fact, it's good because uh, if we want our, uh, quote, our method to be adopted by the community, uh, being able to point to real statistics books was an advantage and it was quickly uh, um, included in the, in the, in the recommendations. Um, now, in the backup slides, I have a few notes on uh, the 20 plus years of experience with it, but uh, don't have time for this in this talk. So we'll turn back to the uh, main theme, testing uh, point null versus a continuum of alternative. So for, uh, for frequentists, I've just described how we do it. So what the Bayesians say, well, let's turn to uh, a friend who's come to several five step meetings, Jim Berger in 1987. He wrote two review articles with co-authors, in fact, one in JAZA and one in uh, uh, Statistical Science. Uh, and, and those make great reading for getting into this problem because the comments are from uh, luminaries in, in the field, uh, Lindley, Cox, et cetera, on both sides. So uh, what should be done? First and foremost, when testing precise hypotheses, formal use of p-value should be abandoned. Almost anything will give a better indication of the evidence provided by the data against H0. Now, David Cox gave him a hard time, so he, he, he uh, uh, talked about this word formal. You can read that if you want. But uh, the main point is uh, forget the duality with, with intervals. That's not the traditional way Bayesians do hypothesis testing which uh, comes from chapter five of Jeffrey's book, uh, all, uh, all Additions. Uh, Bayes' theorem is applied to the models themselves after integrating out all the parameters, including the parameter of interest, theta. Now, especially it seems by uh, people who are new to Bayesian, they get uh, stuff, they get seduced at how logical this is and simple to use and has great benefits such as automatic Occam's razor and Jane's book, for example, just tells you how great this is. In fact, it's full of subtleties, as, as the professional Bayesians know. Uh, uh, starting right with Jeffrey's chapter five, he uses a different prior for integrating out the parameter of interest in testing than for the same parameter in estimation, uh, partly because the ones in estimation are improper, but even for, uh, for the binomial uh, parameter, uh, where it's compact, uh, he, he switches to a different one. Um, so I'm going to refer mainly to this as the uh, reference point, but uh, various statisticians who uh, one thinks of as Bayesians have expressed criticisms of this approach, and I'll, I'll mention a couple of them in, in passing. So here's the, uh, the way Bayesian uh, Jeffries thinks about it. Um, on, uh, on, this, on the uh, picture here, I'll refer to on, on many slides. So we, uh, let's, we have the, uh, the uh, 
theta axis, which is our parameter, uh, we have the, the value of the null hypothesis theta naught here. And then uh, we have pi naught as the prior probability for the null hypothesis, and one minus that is the prior probability for the alternative. So this pi naught is like, uh, to a physicist, is a bit of a direct delta function at that location. Uh, Bayesian uh, statisticians call it probably mass, I believe. Um, in practice, it can have a little width. Uh, so I'm going to call that width uh, epsilon naught. So that, that sets one scale in this problem, which is the width of, of the null hypothesis. Um, now, conditional on H1 being true, then a, a Bayesian is going to need a prior PDF probability density function, which we'll call g of theta for theta. So this is my, uh, this green dotted line here is the prior on theta if H1 is, is true. And the key thing that has a scale to it. There, uh, using the methods to kind of get some kind of scale for the width in theta for, uh, for g of theta, that's what I'm going to call tau and will be, will be green throughout this talk. Uh, so now we have our measurement model. And the one that uh, statisticians like to use a lot for this problem doesn't really correspond to high energy physics uh, where we have Poisson data, but it's, it's, it's fine for, for discussion. Um, so we have some normal density f of x theta from which x is sampled, uh, which has unknown mean theta and known standard deviation or standard error uh, sigma. So that's sampled, let's say, n times. Uh, then we have our likelihood function uh, from the product of those uh, 10 likelihood functions. And that's gonna have a maximum, of course, uh, theta hat. Uh, our MLE is, is just the average arithmetic mean of the x's. Standard deviation is gonna be the original sigma divided by root n. And I'm gonna call that sigma tote. Uh, often the statistics literature, they just always write it as sigma over square root of n. But in fact, in our field, the sigma tote is often disconnected from any concept of a, of a smaller sigma or, or an n. So we'll just call that, that sigma tote. And then uh, how many sigma away, away from, the, from the null? That's of course just the difference between theta hat and the null. And here I've drawn this, uh, this sigma tote here to be about five sigma, the famous five sigma away from our null hypothesis. So, uh, the, these three scales are, are really independent. One would like them to be connected, but in energy physics, they're not. And, and the interesting uh, Jeffries Lindley case is when this, this width of the null is much less than the width of the measure. I think of this as the resolution of the measuring apparatus, which in turn is much less than the width of this prior PDF in, in theta. Now, in the backup slides is, uh, is the uh, rather uh, straightforward calculation of the posterior probabilities of H0, H1, and the base factor B01. The, the, the key point, which I'm sure you can imagine how it comes about, is that uh, when calculating the posterior probability of the alternative, given the measured theta hat, that's going to have in it an integral over theta of uh, the prior, your prior PDF and theta times the likelihood function. And that, that integral, since g of theta is normalized to one, that integral is just gonna pick out a chunk of g of theta, who's, uh, which is gonna be por proportional to the width of the likelihood function uh, divided by the width of, of g of theta. That's really a key point. Now that, that uh, is what gives us Op Occam's razor effect. That's, we'll call that the Occam factor that penalizes H1 for the lack of specificity in theta. So the, so, uh, the probability of a posterior probability of H1 is, is gonna get penalized. It's not gonna let H1 uh, for free uh, allow any value of theta. Uh, the base factor with the, that is the ratio of posterior odds to prior odds, uh, does not depend on these prior P0 and uh, Pi0 and Pi1, they cancel out, which is the reason you have the Bayes factor basically. Uh, but people who think that these Bayes factors therefore don't depend on priors, in fact, they do. Be this, in this problem, it, the Bayes factor is gonna depend directly on this scale tau. Even in the asymptotic large sample limit, you never lose this tau in the uh, denominator of this probability. And that's where the rub comes. So Lindley called this a paradox. It was in Jeffrey's book, although he didn't seem to be bothered too much by it, uh, that uh, 
that this uh, posterior probability for the alternative is proportional to this ratio. Um, what that means is you can have arbitrarily large z value, many, many sigma away from the, the null, which makes your p value for testing H naught can be arbitrarily small and therefore the uh, evidence against the null from frequentist point of view, Fisherian point of view. Um, and yet you can arrange things uh, such that the sigma tote over tau can be arbitrarily small. So the posterior probability of the uh, Alternative is also arbitrarily small and the posterior probability of the null goes to one, strong belief. Now, of course, the fact that these things disagree mathematically is no mystery because they're calculating different things. So you could say there's no paradox, there's no contradiction, but nonetheless, it's unsettling when these two different approaches <laughs> come to completely different conclusions about one, what, one, what one should uh, say or behave about H naught. Um, okay. Uh, and the Bayes factor, uh, this uh, Occam factor in the Bayes factor can flip the likelihood ratio. The, the likelihood ratio of the null hypothesis divided by your best fit value is always less than one because with continuous theta, you can, uh, this theta hat can always uh, give you a perfect fit. And uh, so the likelihood ratio turns out to be e to the minus z squared over two. Uh, that one can rightly say unfairly favors the alternative because uh, it's not penalized for uh, for the fact that it has this extra degree of freedom. Uh, but the Bayes factor, though the simple way of penalizing a tau or sigma tote, uh, that can be much, much bigger than one. So you can, uh, Bayesian thinks this, uh, at least people who like this approach think this is, this is great. This is what you want to happen. Now, recalling that this sigma tote is often sigma over root n, as in the original setup, uh, this paradox is often viewed in terms of sample size as n. That is, for fixed z and tau, the base factor is proportional to the square root of n. That's the way Lindley wrote about it. Uh, but Lindley forgot about tau or didn't mention tau. Bartlett immediately responded, well, you can also view this. Uh, tau or sigma tau is the fact that uh, B01 depends on the scale tau, which can uh, uh, makes the answer more arbitrary in, in Bartlett's words. So here's just a tale I call tale of two z equals five effects. Uh, up at the top is what I've been showing all along. Down at the bottom, I have a different experiment, uh, which now you see this uh, much smaller sigma tau. So again, five sigma away from the null hypothesis. Uh, in the bottom, we have a, so both of these are five sigma, top and bottom, same Z. But uh, in the bottom, we have a larger tau over sigma totes and sigma totes smaller. That's gonna be a larger Bayes factor. Um, so the Bayes factor can be made arbitrarily large even though we're always at five sigma. Now, uh, something we'll come back to several times is, is that of course, in the bottom situation, what uh, some people call the effect size in original units or the parametric difference, the difference between theta hat and theta naught is of course smaller in the bottom picture than the large picture. But whether that means you should take your p-value z equals five less seriously or not is, uh, is a controversy. Uh, so just to summarize, here's our three scales in theta. I don't think I need to go over them again, but, but in this, this situation here where they have this hierarchy is is where uh, where it gets interesting and and this epsilon naught doesn't have to be zero it doesn't have to be a real delta function now another, another point to keep in mind uh, i put it just on one slide but this causes a lot of confusion i found in the literature uh, there's another problem which is different which you have the same null hypothesis theta equals theta naught but instead of testing it versus that continuous theta of the title of the talk we're going to test it versus our simple uh, theta one. So now in green, instead of that distribution, we just have a delta function, piece of a delta function at, at theta one. This is a completely different testing problem from the composite H1. So any, anything you learn from this problem doesn't apply to everything I've talked about so far. The reason is clear. If you fix Z equals five for H naught, uh, as I've done in the top here, and this is the same bottom, uh, uh, likelihood function is on the previous slide. So I'm still five sigma away from pi naught. 
as sigma tote decreases, say due to increasing sample size, this theta hat's going to move away from your alternative hypothesis. At some point, of course, the likelihood ratio will, will favor H naught, even though you're five sigma away from it. The p-value for H1 will become even smaller than the p-value for H naught. If you're a scientist, you start to question both hypotheses at this point, obviously. Uh, but no scientist would just knee jerk to reject the H naught because we're five sigma away from it without noticing that you didn't fit the alternative hypothesis. These, so, but arguments based on this do not apply to the jeffries lindley situation because there, remember, the likelihood ratio, even before you uh, start abandoning the likelihood principle, the likelihood ratio favors the alternative hypothesis. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the setup. I think it's fair to say that uh, every aspect of this has been scrutinized. Uh, it's, it's quite striking how opinions differ on where to put the blame. Uh, hardcore Bayesians, of course, would just say, well, obviously this shows that p-values grossly uh, uh, exaggerate the evidence against the null and move on. But there's, there's a lot of uh, more complicated opinions out there. Uh, and I'll... Uh, take these uh, in turn, uh, no good scientist believes they're pulling all hypothesis, so, so all models are wrong, so why are we testing a point null? Uh, uh, Trafimoff recently pushes this point of view, I already know my null is wrong, so why are we testing it? Uh, uh, but then if you want to use this Bayes factor, uh, Jeffrey's method, is there some objective or default way to set the scale tau, uh, or is it really personal? And then uh, at the heart of this paradox is the different sample size scaling for the p-value and the Bayes factor. So maybe we could patch up either tau or the Bayes factor or the p-value with some root of n somewhere where at least they scale the same way. There's a couple more in the backup I won't have time to get to. Um, so I'll go through what's been said about some of these. And, but first, let's get some examples in mind. I just mentioned though our prototype statistical model uh, it doesn't really matter, it's still an issue, but we typically have a, for a simple prototype model, a Poisson uh, N of, that is we Poisson probability of observing N events passing selection criteria out of a very large number of chances, 10 to 16th of the LAC, uh, with uh, unknown signal string theta and known mean background. That's our prototype problem. Okay, so probably the most, uh, I would say undoubtedly, the most rare thing we search for is proton decay. It's never been seen. Uh, as, as the super Kamioka nu nucleon decay experiment in Japan looked at over 20 metric tons of water for 10 to 20 years with photomultiplier tubes, looking for a few out of the 10 to 33 to 10 to 34 protons to decay. This is exponential decay with about the same mean lifetime for each proton. Uh, let's, and those mean lifetimes are huge. Let's, let's take theta be the decay rate per year into this uh, preferred mode, which is a uh, meson we call the pi zero in a positron. And that's uh, then proportional to one over the lifetime in, in years. So now the decay rate is approximately zero in the standard model and greater than zero in the alternative. Uh, super K could actually reject the null hypothesis. They had the ability to reject the null hypothesis had theta been greater than 10 to the minus 33 or so. Uh, so that sets the scale of our measurement apparatus, uh, resolution, sigma tote. Amazingly, even though we teach the proton decay is forbidden in the standard model, it's actually not. Um, there's, but the decay rate's less than 10 to the minus 187. So that's the width of our delta function, which is safely much smaller than our resolution. What do you use for the scale tau of the prior? Well, over the years, the guesses from Grand Unified Theories, which is what uh, where this excitement comes from in my career, have varied by a factor of 10,000. Uh, whatever it is, it's certainly a lot uh, bigger than, than the sigma tote. Uh, another example, I'll come back to that in a moment, but another example is K-long to mu e. Now, the long-lived neutral k on has a mean lifetime of 5 times 10 to the minus 8 seconds and four main decay modes accounting for essentially all of its decays. But, since the 1950s, it's been of great interest to look for rare decay modes, especially those that are forbidden by the theory of the time. In 1964, there was a shocking surprise was the discovery by Cronin and Fitch of the decay to two charged pions and about two times 10 to the minus three of the decays, 
which was previously strongly forbidden to be, uh, he believed to be forbidden. This won the Nobel Prize because it had many implications, including the question of why the universe has very unequal amounts of matter and antimatter. Now, uh, in the 1980s, as part of my tenure case, in fact, I, I co-led an experiment looking for another forbidden decay mode to a muon electron of opposite charge. So we'll let theta therefore be what we call the branching fraction, which is the B, the, the fraction of K longs that decay to, to, to this final state. So zero is the presumed value in the standard model. Uh, greater than zero, there was a lot of speculation. We, we designed an experiment with the equivalent, I'd say, of sigma total of about 10 to minus 11. Now, while theta equals zero was presumed in the standard model, already there was indirect evidence that neutrinos might have mass, which would allow the decay at maybe the 10 to minus 17 level. So uh, that widened up our delta function, but again, to a width that's much, much smaller than, than our resolution. We had no hope of seeing that uh, amount. Uh, what was the scale for the prior? Well, subjectively, when we started, it was sort of known that uh, B was less than 10 to minus eight, but it was due to a wrong experiment. So it was, it was a bit fuzzy, very fuzzy. There were wildly varying guesses from speculation of what it might be. I remember telling people I thought at the time that there was probably a 1% chance we might find this uh, discovery. Uh, come. So uh, the reason these uh, rare decays are so interesting uh, is that they make use of a general principle that a non-standard unknown, previously unknown particle X with very large mass can cause a known particle to decay with a decay rate that turns out it goes as one over the mass to the fourth of this new unknown particle. And for the Kaon experiment we did, the masses probed this way where the order 100,000 GeV, which you know, this was 30 years before the LHC, which gets up to about 10,000 GeV. And for proton decay, in fact, different uh, masses, uh, masses of a different particle are probed up to 10 to 16th GeV. Uh, I really don't see a useful way to calculate a meaningful base factor for these examples. This, this scale tau on their arbitrary, the form of the prior is speculative at best, essentially arbitrary. However, the point's been made that even if tau is arbitrary or unknown, the Bayesian logic that the base factor goes as one over sigma tot still remains. Thus, people claim that coherence requires sample size dependence of inference. Um, I just want to emphasize that proton with a mean decay rate of 10 to the minus 32 per year would be an effect size in original <laughs> units, if you like, of spectacular importance to physics. Even though the mean lifetime, which would be 10 to 22 years, uh, compares with 10 to the 10th years for the age of the universe. So it's, it's, uh, in, so in our field, small effect sizes can still be of practical significance, if you like. There is no non-zero decay rate for proton decay that is too small to be of scientific interest if, if observed. Same is true for, for K long to mu e. Anybody who observes K long to mu e would win a Nobel Prize with the, the feasible searches available once, once confirmed, of course, as it would uh, point to a new force in nature that's mediated by this uh, some new particle. Third high energy physics example at, at Slack in 1978, they, uh, with the electronic uh, lin linear accelerator there, they, they uh, scattered spin polarized electrons off nuclei and see if they went left or right when they scattered. Uh, this is a binomial model with parameter rho. The physicists use the asymmetry, uh, number left minus number right divided by total. That's uh, just one minus twice the binomial parameter. And the experiment measured this asymmetry to be minus 1.5 times 10 to the minus four with statistical and systematic uncertainties each about 10%. So yes, they scattered electrons and counted number going left on right in the order of 10 to the 10th electrons. Uh, this result uh, helped lead uh, the next year to the Nobel Prize in Physics for Glashow, Weinberg, and Salam uh, model, now the standard model. Um, now it's not clear that this hierarchy is, is really in this experiment, but I brought it up because the, the literature and the statistics on practical significance and whatnot uh, uh, has discussion about binomial parameters very close to 0.5. And this, uh, this shows the capability in, in at least one science of, of measuring them and keeping the systematics under control. Okay, so with those examples in mind, let's see what statisticians have to say about Jeffrey's Lindley paradox. Uh, these, and let's start with uh, no good scientist believes they're point null hypothesis since all models are wrong, so why are we testing it? Um, 
Now I'm going to just give snippets. So to, you're going to, if you're interested, of course, you want to see the full passages. The references with the page numbers are in my archive paper I have on the slide too. But even out of context, I think these quotes give you a flavor. I'm sorry, I haven't really had a chance to update this much since 2014, and, I, and I'm happy if you have some new quotes for me. So let's start with the ultimate subjectivist, uh, Dennis Lindley. In commenting on this paper by Berger, one of Berger's papers, he lauds the triumph of Jeffrey's general method of significance test, putting a concentration of prior probability on the null, no ignorance here, and evaluating the posterior probability using what we call base factors. This in spite of the fact that he didn't like Jeffrey's rule for estimation, of course. Now, an objectivist who prefers his uh, decision-based reference analysis to Bayes factors is Jose Bernardo. He says, uh, Jeffries is forced to use a mixed prior which puts a lump of probability on the null. This has a very upsetting consequence. Uh, I find it difficult to accept a procedure which is known to produce a wrong answer. That is giving high probability for the null when you're five sigma away under specific but not controllable circumstances. Uh, Gelman and Rubin, more, general, more generally, realistic prior distributions in social science to social science do not have a mass of probability at zero. Raftery, uh, 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 by the way, I, perhaps I should mention that uh, it's been shown if you get rid of that mass, then, then the, the Jeffrey's Lindley paradox, a lot of it goes away. Raftery said, uh, social scientists, he disagreed. He said, in, uh, social science in replying to them, he, he said, social scientists are prepared to act as if they had prior distributions with point masses of zero. Social scientists often entertain the possibility an effect size is small. Uh, Christian Robert and Rousseau, down with point masses. The requirement that one uses a point mass as a prior when testing for a point null hypothesis is always an embarrassment and often a cause of misunderstanding in our classrooms. They advocated decision theory approach to Alstom. Uh, one of the uh, influential papers in this area was by Edwards, Lindman, and, and Savage. Uh, they note that in typical applications, one of the hypotheses is null hypothesis is known by all concerned to be false from the alts, offset, as, as Bergson had said. Uh, Bartman said, uh, competent scientists do not believe their own models or theories, but rather treat them as convenient fictions. A small or even zero prior probability for the current theory is true, is not just a device to make posterior probabilities as small as p-values, is the way good physicists, good scientists think. Uh, and uh, Cadane said, for the last 15 years or so, I've been looking seriously for spe spe special cases in which I might have some serious belief in a null hypothesis. I found only one, that's the astrology example. I did not expect to test a precise hypothesis as a serious statistical calculation. Okay, well, as you can see from the example, some of these statisticians that have evidently not been socializing with many high energy physicists. In the, in the literature I consulted, I encountered very few statisticians who noted, as did Zellner, that physical laws such as M e equals mc squared are point hypotheses, and many other examples of sharper precise hypotheses can be given and is incorrect to exclude such hypotheses a priori or turn them unrealistic. Already in this influential Edwards et al. paper, there was this key point uh, that you can have this with. Uh, Bayesians must remember that the null hypothesis is a hazily defined small region rather than a point. And indeed, it need not be zero. And, and there's, there's literature on this point. Uh, Berger and friends did a study of uh, quantitative study of how, how wide it has to be before you start to mess up the math. Now, in terms of whether or not we believe our, our model, uh, there's some points to be made there. At the, at the heart of measurement models in high energy physics are well-established equations that are commonly called laws of nature. Uh, the current laws of, of our field, which have survived decades of intense scrutiny with only a few model modifications, you probably know are called collectively called the standard model, but they have a status of laws of nature. Uh, this has some parameters of quarks and leptons, as well as couplings to determine reaction, reaction rates, which with a few exceptions have all been measured reasonably precisely. Um, I refer here to the equations of such laws or of the alternatives considered as potential replacements for them. These are core physics models. Uh, and these alternatives are, uh, the standard models typically nested in, in these alternative models. Now, indeed, multiple complications arise in going from the core physics model to the full measurement model that describes the probability densities 
for observations such as the momentum structure of particles emerging from very messy proton-proton collisions at the LHC. And all models are wrong can certainly apply to the detector simulation and calibrations where we use parametric approximations like normal or not normal are often used. But the pure core physics model still exists as testable hypotheses that may regard it as point null hypotheses. And it's certainly worth trying to understand if some physical parameter theta in the larger alternative core physics model is equal to the standard model value, even if it is necessary to do so as it is through the smoke of imperfect detector descriptions with many uninteresting and imperfectly known nuisance parameters. Indeed, uh, much of what distinguishes the capability of experiments and experimenters is how well they can do precisely that uh, by determining the detector response through careful calibration, cross decks, and clever experimental design as there was in that Slack experiment with the left-right asymmetry to get the systematics so well. Now, this is not just in high energy physics, so there are lots of physics. Uh, even I could say, especially with very strong prior belief in the null, physicists want to test as stringently as possible. Uh, as the difference between believing a lot and how stringently it's been tested. Um, and I give some examples there else you can read about later. Uh, furthermore, we have a, an advantage that in high energy physics, these tests of the core physics models benefit from what we believe to be the world's most perfect random sampling mechanism, namely quantum mechanics. In each of many repetitions of a given initial state, nature randomly picks out a final state according to the weights uh, given by the laws of physics and quantum mechanics. Furthermore, uh, a perfect incarnation of identical is present in the fundamental quantum mechanical property that we call indistinguishable. All MLM particles of the same type, like all electrons, are indistinguishable. The wave function squared is invariant if any two of them are, are, are interchanged. So, uh, but there's also a deeper point to be made about core physics models which is, they're not just a good approximation in the ordinary sense of the word. They're, uh, they are mathematical limits. Uh, so the equations in Newtonian physics have been superseded by those of special and general relativity, but the Newtonian equations are not just approximations that did a respectable job in predicting everybody's orbit except uh, Mercury. They are the correct mathematical limits as the speed and gravitational field go to the zero. That is, uh, definitional limit. If, if you specify some maximum tolerance for error in the kinetic energy due to the approximation of Newtonian mechanics, then I can tell you a speed below which it will, uh, the Newtonian answer will always be within that tolerance of, of the, of the uh, special relativity answer. Uh, another way of saying that is the Newtonian kinetic energy, which you may recall is one half mb squared, that's the correct first term in the expansion, if we take the special relativity kinetic energy and expand it in powers of, of the speed over the speed of light. Now there's an analogous deeper concept that arises in the context of effective field theories. An effective field theory in a sense consists of the correct first terms in a power series of inverse powers of some energy scale lambda that is much higher than the applicable scale of the effective field theory. It's widely believed and indeed hoped that the standard model will be super uh, seated by a larger uh, theory in which it is nested. In that sense, we believe and indeed hope that the standard model is incomplete, which you can call wrong. Uh, but it's also widely believed that when this new larger model is found, the standard model will be the correct effective field, theory, the correct effective field theory of the new field theories at energies much, much less than this new scale. So in that sense, we believe the standard model is not wrong. It will survive the way uh, one half mv squared has survived as a, as a limit. So my conclusion is that the statement, all models are wrong, but some are useful. It's not wrong in high energy physics, but it's also not useful in high energy physics. Uh, it's certainly wrong as people have done to use this notion to downplay the importance of testing a point null hypothesis in high energy physics. Uh, what else have some statisticians said? Well, most researchers would not put 50% prior probability on H0 uh, or larger, they would say. The purpose of an experiment is often to disprove H0 and researchers are not performing experiments that believe that they believe a priori will fail half the time. Uh, well, actually in high energy physics, we do. Uh, uh, hundreds, if not thousands of papers have been published on testing the standard model without rejecting it. Of course, we don't use P less than 0.05. Uh, 
Uh, here I just did a search the other day for papers at the LIC by the two largest experiments with search for in the title and not observation. And uh, uh, over 900 came up. And if I'd included the third LIC experiment, there would have been uh, over a thousand. Uh, and these have been cited a lot. These are influential papers, even though they don't find what they're what they're looking for because they constrain speculation. Some of these, uh, admittedly, uh, the null hypothesis was a standard model with a missing piece. So it was looking for first observation of something predicted by the standard model, which is indeed not a null that's believed. Um, but they didn't have enough power to reject that null. Um, and others are searches for things like uh, supersymmetry, neutralinos, sleptons, et cetera, which uh, have not been seen. OK, uh, that's uh, it about uh, do we believe our models. And uh, now let's move on to the last two. Is there an objective or default way to set this scale tau? Uh, should the inference depend on sample size? Now, fundamentally, uh, to me, I can make sense out of all the, if it's real fully subjective uh, Bayesian, the scale appears to be inescapably personal and subjective. Um, uh, when one of those early Berger review articles, they said as much that the precise null testing situation is a prime example in which objective procedures do not exist. Testing a Bayesian hypothesis is a situation in which there is clearly no objective Bayesian analysis and by implication slamming p-values, no sensitive objective analysis whatsoever. Uh, that hasn't stopped Jim and, and his friends uh, uh, from attempting to formulate principles for specifying a default values for, for tau for commuting K-science results. I, I have a slide on that in the backup. Uh, Bartlett said, well, you might get rid of this different sample size scaling by scaling tau by one over root n. So then that would make the Bayes factor independent of n as the p-value is. Uh, David Cox suggested this as, as well. And, and uh, Jeffries is also this, uh, this idea that if you're testing zero, you probably only believe in non-zero values near zero pervades uh, a number of st statistics literature. The economist uh, Lemer I said similar, similarly, a prior that allocates positive probability to subspaces of the parameter space, but is otherwise diffuse, represents a peculiar and unlikely blend of knowledge and ignorance. Uh, but as you've seen in these examples, this peculiar and unlikely blend is actually uh, common in energy physics. It's basically what I do for a living. Um, now, in the search for any non-subjective scale that's independent of sample size for, for tau, one option seemingly hand is to go back to the sigma tote, which is sigma over root n. Uh, imagine only one observation and that original sigma, you could say it's, it sets the scale for a single measurement. This goes back to Jeffries. It's been repeated by many, many people, including Cass and Wasserman. And, and uh, well, it, it starts out making sense when you need a scale and you look around for something in the same units. Well, maybe that's the scale, but, uh, the problem is in, in high energy physics, the sigma tote and the tau in the examples we have, they're independent scales. <laughs> so using one to set the other just uh, is taking to some place, which I don't think is very relevant. And furthermore, as I mentioned at the beginning, the detector may just have some intrinsic resolution as we call it, the sigma tote for which no definite sigma or n is, is evident. It's not broken down into that. It's some Poisson problem. Uh, Raftery pointed this out that the important ambiguity of the definition of n, the sample size, and he, he gave a few examples where you can try to pull out something, but I think this is a, a tough problem. Now, uh, furthermore, for some of these important searchers of departures from the standard model, during my career, this, this uh, measurement apparatus resolution has decreased by nearly a factor of 10 to the fourth. That CAN experiment we did uh, decreased it by 10 to the three uh, uh, from previous experiments. So, uh, and how do we do that? Well, in, in searches with no background, it turns out this scale is more like one over n than one over root n. So it's not that as hard to go down by four orders of magnitude. Still, it's an accomplishment. I, I just don't see any way to have an Occam factor uh, that you're going to rely on when your scale is, is changing by four orders of magnitude. And, and, but looking ahead, nor do I, for those advocating you should adjust the p-value, I don't see any convincing rationale for adjusting the p-value when your sigma toes varying by four is magnitude either. Uh, 
the latest word on this I've heard uh, from was it was a, a talk Jim Berger gave it uh, two years ago at, what, at one of our conferences, which has food for thought and, and, and country examples using our problem of, of the Poisson of signal plus background rather than the uh, statisticians problem with food for thought. Now, in terms of saying the scale tau in some objective way, this of course was an opening for, for Lindley to make his usual argument that the, stas, the uh, objectivists are getting lost in their Greek letters and lose can, contact with the actual context. I, I too find it puzzling that one can first argue that this optimum factor is this wonderful uh, feature of the Bayesian logic that's absent from frequentist reason. And then you resort to an, some ob objective prior that is essentially makes this outcome factor arbitrary. And for me, the arbitrary of this scale is a big op obstacle to more use, uh, use of Bayes factors in our testing problem. Uh, of course, you could report it as a function of tau since it typically scales with tau, but, but that just kicks the problem down the road. I don't think it solves it. And uh, Cass has pointed this out, the Bayes factors for hypothesis testing remain sensitive to first order to this uh, scale, the choice of the prior on the parameter being tested, the results are contaminated by a constant, that's this tau, that does not go away asymptotically. This approach is essentially non-existent in neuroscience. Uh, the Gelman approach, it's way too much to summarize on one or even two slides. Uh, he, uh, as you know, has been a long time advocate of model checking using posterior predictive p-values as, as in his, his book. Uh, He's also not a fan of Occam's razor. He says, my, my, my own perspective as a social scientist is completely different from, from those in, in physical sciences who, who find Occam's razor unquestionably reasonable. I've just about never heard someone in social science object to the inclusion of a variable or an interaction in a model. Um, so, and in fact, it can do damage by not allowing you to add a variable when you want to add a variable. So, so adding a parameter in sociology, uh, and checking it with his model checking is, is his approach. Uh, there was a nice review of this in the last decade with, with uh, Shalizi. Um, and and uh, this, um, since this uses tail probabilities, it's, it's considered to be kind of out of the scope of, of the normal Bayesian confirmation theory, although it does go back to people like Box's uh, prior predictive p-values. Uh, so that's another one with interesting uh, comments that I review there. Now, in high energy physics, of course, we do model checking, uh, especially for characterizing the, the detector response. Uh, adding parameters is common, and uh, people use the traditional methods, FTEX, BIC, not as much uh, predictive p values, I would say. But of, of course, model checking is, cr is, is crucial in this uh, detector model. But for the core physics models, adding a parameter can either be a Nobel Prize winning discovery as it was for uh, the K long decay, uh, or it can be an ignoble embarrassment if your claim uh, for a non-zero balanced standard model parameter is, 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 is false. So th that's the key issue I'm talking about today, not whether or not there's, there's some noise in our detector model. Okay, finally, uh, let's see, I'm actually, maybe I'm over time. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go through this quickly. Yeah, uh, if you can wrap up in about five minutes or so, that'd yeah, be Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm over time. Well, uh, I opened too many parentheses. Uh, uh, this will go quickly. Should the interpretation of a p value depend on sample size? Um, if we just step back from this Jeffries Lindley paradox and ask, what have statisticians of any flavor said about sample size? Um, I found this amusing old note by uh, Jack Good, who uh, says, Dr. Deborah Mayo, who's tuned in, uh, asked, how do we convince the naive student simplissimus that a given Taylor probability, say one out of 100, is weaker evidence against the null hypothesis when the sample is larger? It's a familiar fact to Bayesian statisticians. He, he shows it for simple versus simple, in which it's true, but then claims without foundation that it applies to simple versus composite. So that's why I made that point earlier on. And he says the real objection of p-values is that you got to normalize them to like some effective size of n equals 100, but this seems not to have caught on. Uh, likelihood is Royal wrote this uh, paper, which did make a key point that we need to distinguish between sample size dependence of the evidence of the statement signal at p-value less than 0.5 or better and evidence from the reporting of the p-value itself, because in the simple versus simple, they actually go in different directions with sample size. 
Uh, but his discussion is all about simple versus simple, again, where the alternative hypothesis does not have a perfect fit to the for the data. And in fact, this likelihood of school can't deal with compositeness, basically. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll skip over this one, but this this just makes another uh, the, the same points I've been making over and over. Uh, uh, Deborah Mayo, in, in her book, uh, Statistical Inference and Statistical Testing, said uh, Rosenthal and Gaito, who did the survey of psychologists, they, they discovered the statistical significance at a given level was often fallaciously taken as evidence of a greater discrepancy from the null hypothesis, the larger the sample size. In fact, it is indicative of less of a discrepancy from the null if it resulted from the smaller sample size. Now I clarify with Deborah that by discrepancy, she meant the population parametric dif difference from the null, what I call effect size in original uh, units. That is certainly, if you stick with five sigma and your sample size get bigger, then indeed the difference of theta hat from theta naught gets smaller as we saw from my tale of two z equals five effects. And uh, thinking that uh, the, uh, Evidence is bigger is what she calls a mountain on a molecule fallacy, which is an, indeed a fallacy. You can read that after so when I, since I'm behind the schedule. Um, so, uh, uh, so a summary of uh, just to, to summarize, this uh, condition is is common in high energy physics. Tiny effect sizes can be of huge significance in in high energy physics. The sample size scaling of inference for a fixed p-value is problematic. If it's problematic to claim that you should somehow change your inference to, in, in our field, five sigma is five sigma. Of course, you put it in context of all the other things that determine your threshold for alpha. But, uh, 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 and modern searches can have a sigma to a factor 10 to four smaller than when my career began. So you're really gonna be scaling Occam factors or p-values by orders of magnitude. Uh, and, it, this dependence on the problematic tau expressing range of prior belief and how to specify for scientific communication, to me, that's still an, an open problem. So uh, meanwhile, we continue with, with number of sigma for p-values. I have in the back of my backup slides, four or five slides on what all the, the luminaries, Neyman, Pearson, and, and Lehman and whatnot say about how you pick your, your alpha. It's certainly not a one size fits all five sigma, which is without foundation. And you do take into context uh, prior belief and, and loss functions uh, informally. Uh, but uh, uh, the starting point, how, many, how much data it came from, uh, we don't take into account. And this is what we do for a living. So if that's wrong, it would be nice to see a convincing argument why? And uh, uh, in that sense, I think the status quo of the philosophical foundations uh, is, uh, is unsettling. So that's uh, th just to acknowledge uh, the, the names of all the physicists and statisticians are, are in my paper and note, and my sponsor is the DOE Office of Energy Physics. Thank you, and sorry for, uh, for claiming I'd be under 50 minutes. Happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Bob, for this very, very nice talk. I see a few kind of uh, uh, clapping there and the, and the reactions. <laughs> so um, uh, yeah, so anybody, uh, does anybody have any, any questions for Bob? Uh, we, we have, you know, here uh, some time for questions. So you raised raise, or raise or answers, answers, you're welcome to, yeah. <laughs> yeah, any comments, answers, uh, uh, any reactions? So uh, you can use the raise hand button or put it on the chat box. Um, um, either way is, is, a, is a good way of asking questions or making comments. Okay, is that right? yeah, that's right. Okay, so uh, John uh, Vilan has a question or comment. Uh, so thank thank you very much for for uh, very stimulating talk. I I I a bit confused about the um uh, the concern about what happens when the sample size goes up because I would have expected that if the alternative model is true, then as you make the uh, experiment more sensitive, that your your p value, if you do it in those terms, would get smaller, right? That that you would expect if there is a real effect there that the, the more sensitive your experiment is or the larger your sample size and the traditional statistical uh, terminology, I you would expect that, that that you would get a lot, you know, your, your um, likelihood would be, more, would be more tightly clustered around uh, what, what you're looking for. And so therefore it, it would, uh, 
uh, right. the p value wouldn't change. So that, so that that seems like a weird limit to take to, to hold the p value constant it, and change it, the sample size. It, that's right. So it is a weird limit. I should have made that more clear. That this is not what you, that that these are two different situations. Um, because in this example, for example, these the top and bottom are, are discrepant uh, results, which is your point. Um, and and so I, I yeah so I I spoke about it as, as if it was the same experiment, uh, uh, um, adding more data, but that was uh, in, that was speaking too loosely. You can just think of these are two different situations where. Uh, uh, the theta is in one case is proton decay and in another case is, is k and decay or, or two different experiments. Uh, actually, the way I, I wrote an email to a statistician the other day and I, I just uh, thinking about exactly this point, the way, the way, I, the way I phrase it, let's, let's keep it simple by having the theta be the same physics theta. So let's say Two different proton decay experiments. So this is the decay rate for proton decay in both the top and the bottom. But these are two different imagined experiments before uh, they happen. Now we're we're trying to set up a procedure to analyze our data. And the top case is an, an early proton decay experiment that had uh, sensitivity of a particular level. And we imagine, well, suppose it sees five sigma. And the bottom is a, is a later proton decay experiment, which is much better experiment, much less background. And so this could be the result of the, of the second experiment. And then how are we going to uh, think about uh, these two different results? That is, if the first experiment gets what we see at the top and, uh, and the second experiment is never done, but had it been done and it, and it saw what we see at the bottom, uh, would we in advance think we're going to interpret those two the same way because they're both five sigma or would we think of them uh, differently because the base factor is so different? Yeah, it, it, that, that seems like that, that gets to what, you know, when physicists use, use base factors, we usually um, are thinking, well, maybe there's some arbitrariness in the, in the scale and so the absolute value of the base base value detector doesn't mean so much, but but comparing them is still helpful sometimes. And so in the situation where it's two measurements of the same quantity, you know, you may not be able to say with great confidence what tau is, but you can at least compare the two experiments by saying that well, whatever our prior understanding of the parameter is, it's the same in both both experiments. That's right. So that's why I rephrase it the way I did in the email to the statistician. That it's two experiments measuring the same thing, but they're not going to be in nobody's formulation. Going back at the Lindley, I think, are they are they, are they um, just taking more data in the same experiment because then, then you got to worry about the data being consistent with itself. This is just two different scenarios you can imagine an unfolding with your different experiments. But yes, I, I, and and like I say, this uh, this likelihood width in the proton decay is changed by uh, four orders of magnitude. The first experiments were of sensitive to say 10 to the minus 28, 10 to the minus 29. 10 to the minus 30, and the latter ones are up to 10 to the minus 33 or so. Uh, I, I just can't imagine we would change our interpretation of five sigma by by by, by numbers derived from those from 10 to the four, whether it's the fourth root or the square root or, or anyway. Uh, so we have a, an additional question or comment from from Adi. So Adi, please go ahead. Hi, this is uh, more of a clarification. I think it was, uh, I thought about it when you were talking about the Japanese experiment that ran for a very long time on proton decay or something, but whether or not it applies to that experiment is less relevant. More broadly, are there experiments in which you're estimating astronomically small probabilities? Would this count as kind of rare event? You're trying to, you're trying to estimate a probability when, it, when you think it's 10 to the minus uh, 20 or you know something of that kind. Are, are any of these discussions affect, affected by trying to do rare event uh, probability calculations? Um, well, or... um, so that that's actually a, an interesting question because someone looked into that. So um, fundamentally, I suppose you could say it's binomial and we're in the extreme uh, Poisson limit of, of, of binomial, but where exponential decay comes from 
And when I teach the undergraduate course on particle physics, uh, quantum mechanics, actually, it's in quantum mechanics, where exponential decay comes from is with a constant decay rate for small times. And then you, uh, you, you make the usual argument, uh, either from the differential equation or from, from infinitesimals to get, to get the exponential. Um, and so where does constant decay rate come at small times? Well, that comes from a, a theorem called Fermi's golden rule in quantum mechanics. And when you teach Fermi's golden rule, at some point you make an approximation that the time you're looking at the system cannot be too small and it cannot be too long. And so in these early proton decay experiments, someone did ask, well, if we think this proton has a lifetime of 10 to the 28th years and we're looking for one year, how do we know that exponential decay is even applicable? <laughs> because Fermi's goal of real sense. And, and I know at the time someone wrote a, wrote a paper on it and said it was okay. And I've been looking for that paper for 35 years and haven't been able to find it. But I'm not sure if that was your, your question, but, but they're, they're, they get to be, theoretical issues in quantum mechanics when you start talking about the, the first year of in you know, the first 10 to the minus 28 of exponential decay. Um, yeah, I guess my question was on the statistical side of the statistical issues arising from trying to, well, there's now 10 to the 30 protons and we're observing them for 20 years, but their yeah. decay rate is 10 to the minus uh, something. And so are we getting into places where like we should be bothered about rare event probability estimations and well it's, and, uh, it's, it's from... the ex i would say no it's the extreme uh poisson limit of binomial uh and uh, that is the pr probability any proton decays during this discrete time integral is the integral of that exponential and and so the number we see is binomial with a binomial parameter that's yeah uh, but it's it's easy to calculate it's assuming independence of the protons, which, which uh, we believe. Um, some are inside the oxygen nucleus in water. And so that's why I said that lifetimes are almost the same, depending on how tightly bound they are in water, there's a tiny effect to change the lifetimes slightly. But uh, I, I, th I think the statistical part is, is, is just, th there's, I don't know of any subtleties in the trivial calculation, probably per proton times number of protons, probably a proton per year times number of protons times number of years, done. Uh, so I, I have one question. So when, when you were talking about the kind of the, the uh, effect of the sample size and the p-value or how to account for that, I was thinking of this paper that that Louis has, where he makes the point that the interpretation of your p-value should sort of depend on the plausibility of the of the uh, of the claim. Like you know, if someone claims a five sigma effect for discovering the Higgs boson, that's you know one thing. But you know, this, uh, claiming a five sigma effect for discovering a uh, faster and light neutrinos is a, is a different thing. So how does that fit in? Like, should that be understood as like a Bayesian way of looking at things? Like, is that like almost like building the Bayesian prior into this somehow, or or like well, how does it? As is so uh, this is uh, what I didn't have time to talk about, but since you asked the question, I'll use the opening. So, so from the beginning, it was realized that alpha had to come from somewhere that was basically arbitrary, and you didn't want to use 0.05 just because that was what was the appendix of your manual. Um, and uh, you know, Naaman and Pearson said how to balance power and uh, and type one, type two errors has to be left to the to the investigator. Lehman gave a little more guidance that uh, usually some choice should be taking consideration the power, but also, uh, but, but of course, if that's a power function, that's not so great. Another consideration is the attitude of the hypothesis before the experiment is, is performed. So that's why I didn't believe the six sigma faster than lighter neutrinos. Um, and, uh, and then uh, Kendall and Stewart say, you, you gotta worry about the, the costs. And in, indeed, the reason we didn't announce the discovery of the Higgs boson in, in December 2011, when we could have, if we combined the data from the two experiments, was that there was a cost for a wrong a type one error cost would have been huge for the field to declare a discovery that wasn't false. There was no competition. And so we waited six months till each of the experiments had five sigma instead of having to combine them. So of course, the Bayesian criticism is that is that the way, uh, uh, Lehman and uh, Kendall and Stewart talk about taking account your, your prior belief in, in your costs is, is informal and, and not in, in, indeed. 
whereas the Bayesians would claim to have a way to all package it up into, into logical uh, form formalism. But um, yeah, so Louis's paper, I look, uh, he and I talk a lot about this uh, because it's not just Louis, it's, it's and, and if you look in my, my, uh, my paper on Jeffrey's Lindley Paradox, I have a session, a section called uh, the Five Sigma Mythology, because clearly no real scientist uses Five Sigma consistently for their threshold. I mean, that's just dumb. And, and, and so the, the press agents are told that, but th that can't possibly make sense, which is the point of Louis's uh, paper. And also that section in my, uh, in my uh, I'll refer you to that section in my paper so I can uh, stop answering that question. <laughs>